Hello, everybody. Uh, Vince Horn here again for another episode of Buddhist Geeks. We're doing it live on Google Hangout, and I'm here today with our special guest, Lodro Rinsler. Lodro is a good friend, author, uh, Buddhist geek of all sorts of shades and varieties, and uh, is here today uh, joining us from his apartment. I'm, I'm imagining in uh, in Brooklyn. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's uh, it's always fun to hang out with you. And, and it seems like every time we hang out, it's it's in this medium, so we'll have to remedy that some someday. Right. But it's fun. It's good to see you. Um, cool. So, you know, I think most people that tune into the show have probably um, heard of your work and have probably uh, seen some of your writings. Um, you were at the conference last year, gave a great talk on Spider-Man and uh, and spiritual authority and teachers. And um, so, so I won't spend a lot of time introducing you, except to say um, a couple new things that you've been working on are one, um, a book which we're going to talk a little bit about um, called Walk Like a Buddha. And I love the subtitle. It's uh, Even If Your Boss Sucks, Your Ex Is Torturing You, and You're Hung Over Again, um, which I could relate, unfortunately, to all three of those um, <laughs> aspects of the subtitle. Um, and then also you have started, I think since we last spoke, you started a new project called the Institute uh, for Compassionate Leadership. Um, so it would be cool to talk about both of those things. And it sounds like you've been busy. Yeah, that's that's definitely that's definitely the word for it. I've been busy, but it's all good things, you know. I mean, I feel I feel really wonderful about both uh, the first book, The Buddha Walks Into a Bar, and now the new one, Walk Like a Buddha, came out October fifteenth. So it is now officially two months old, and it seems to be kicking butt, which is good. Um, how, how do you how do you measure that? How do you measure kicking butt? I mean, obviously, there's like traditional things like how many books you sold, but how do you know as an author that that it's kicking butt? So okay, there's there's that conventional aspect, right? So the other day I got a phone call from my publisher, and they basically said it's kicking butt, and I said great, you know, it sounds like so basically that means that it's selling well and that people are picking it up and all of that. Um, but for me personally, it's it's just the feedback that people get, uh, you know. So these days with Facebook and Twitter and email and you know all sorts of these these different mediums. People are actually posting that they read the book, that they liked the book, that they got something out of it. So that's the meaningful thing for me. And I mean, it's interesting. You, you know, in your introduction, you said at this point people uh, know your work or some you know they have some relationship to any of the speaking or talking you know the books, any of that. When you and I did this last time, not a single human being, well, I don't want to say that, but like 99% of the people that were listening to the podcast probably had no clue who I was. And it's been a really weird year, two years now, actually, since the first book came out, uh, of sort of like looking at getting my work out there more and seeing how it's been received, both positively and negatively. And um, simultaneously, like not drinking my own Kool-Aid, but being really touched by the fact that people do write me and say, you know, this book was helpful to me and here's how. Um, and those sorts of people that, you know, take the time to actually not only just read the book, but then reach out after and say that they found it helpful in some way. It's been so incredibly meaningful for me. It's been transformative, actually, for me personally, to know that I, even though I may not necessarily meet someone, um, that I've been in conversation with them. Mm. And with the Institute, you know, I, I I saw that you started this for a really interesting and kind of uh, touching reason, and I was curious if you could share a little bit about how that came to be and um, what, what sort of drove you to, uh, to, to work on this project. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, when you're friends with Vince Horn, he will ask you about your dead friend over coffee. <laughs> um, Cheers. Yeah, cheers. Uh, yes, yeah, so the Institute for Compassionate Leadership, I mean, one of the things that, going full circle, I mean, I was reflecting once again on uh, when you and I last did a podcast, it was right when the first book came out, and there was, you know, I went on this giant tour for it, and there is a lot of allure to actually sort of get a puffed head of like, oh, the book's doing well, blah, blah, blah. And I think I bought into that for a little bit. I really do. And... Uh, and then there was this period of time where my life just crashed down around me, where um, you know my fiance broke off our engagement and moved to London. Um, I lost my full-time job, you know, and then most significantly, uh, my one of my best friends died. And 
and then even after that, like all of my worldly belongings were washed away in Hurricane Sandy, and then my father died. And so it was sort of like a real like one-two punch from samsara, the cycle of suffering we seem to be in, and sort of humbled me in a different way, uh, which is not to say I don't continue to have my own various forms of arrogance and selfishness and things like that, but um, at least, you know, I stopped buying into that, like, ego thing around the books. Um, so to answer your question more directly, yeah, my, my, one of my best friends from college passed away. He was 29 at the time. He was someone that had worked on the Obama campaign starting when Obama was running for the Senate race. Way back. In 2004. And he uh, was a wonderful, compassionate loving human being. And when he passed away, I was encouraged by many of his friends in that world to go out and work in Ohio and continue to uh, do similar sorts of work that he was passionate about to help get the president reelected. And um, flash forward to January 23rd, 2013. So all of 11 months ago, uh, I'm at the staff ball, which is about some 7,000 people who had worked on the campaign, all in their formal wear, many of them young, younger than me, um, inspired. They had their first taste of creating social change and some sort of sense of meaningful change in the world. And um, most of them were not sure what they were going to do next. And it was this beautiful speech that you can find on YouTube where the president got up and thanked them for the work and said, I, I can't wait to see what you go on to do. And then at the same time, folded up his notes, put them in his pocket and talked extemporaneously about my friend Alex that passed away and how he had actually created real change in his short life because he was driven, focused, kind, loving, and um, not surprisingly, like I you know, stopped for 10 minutes straight. But when I picked myself up from that, this idea for the Institute for Compassionate Leadership felt fully formed in my head. Um, Whereas, you know, how can we create more people like that? And in the like 30 second version of the Institute is it's a leadership training and job placement organization for young people who want to create social change and they're not exactly sure what they want to do. So we get them executive coaches who get them focused on, oh, I guess I'm interested in gun control or I'm interested in education reform or I'm interested in poverty reduction. And once they figure that out, we get them a mentor in that field. And the training aspect revolves around meditation as tools for actually becoming more self-aware and compassionate, community organizing in the Obama campaign style of actually trying to empower people through human-to-human -human interaction in an authentic way, and then traditional leadership skills like negotiation, fundraising, things like that, that are not often taught at universities these days. And then at the end of this whole thing, once they've really figured out what they want to do, we help network on their behalf to get them meaningful work. Nice, nice. And I'm curious, um, are, are you sort of bringing together various uh, people to kind of support each of those different aspects. I mean, obviously, I'm imagining you're you're involved in the meditation parts, but do you bring sort of folks in who are kind of fundraising experts and and job placement people? And how, what's your team like? Yeah, it's it is. It's a really really wonderfully diverse group. And um, you know, I've always believed that if you want a diverse group of students in any setting, be it Buddhist, nonprofit, whatever, you need a diverse group of leaders, and we definitely have that. So. Um, we have wonderful people on our board, you know, Sharon Salzberg and Sakyan Nipam Rinpoche are both on the board from the spiritual side. We have Buffy Wicks, who is the uh, director of operation vote for the Obama campaign, sort of representing some of the organizational side. We have people who uh, were director of operations for Google Search Inside Yourself. We've got uh, people who are running, you know, slow, uh, sorry, innovation and business school out in San Antonio. Uh, it's a really interesting and wonderful mix. And then on the faculty side, it is, you know, we always pair someone from the organizing world with someone from the meditation world, and ideally, they have some traditional leadership skills that they also offer because they have business skills of their own. Um, but you know, if not, we bring in those people as well. So it's we try and balance those three things pretty equally. Nice. And what kind of response are you getting from um, from young people? Are are you seeing a lot of people interested in this sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, you know, we just opened up our application process in something like late August. And we launched our first class in about three weeks. And we have 18 applicants, and that'll probably yield about 12 to 14 students when all is said and done. And that's exactly what we wanted. Exactly. And I think, you know, we run a new class starting in July. So we're going to do January, July classes, and they run for six months at a time. And, um, you know, I bet 
for that class, we're going to have to start really, really more, not that we didn't carefully screen before, but really being quite selective about who we accept because we don't want the classes to be too big. We want everyone to get a lot of personal attention. Nice, nice. Okay, cool. So this is interesting. I, I love these kind of innovations where, um, you know, we're taking some of the things, you know, that, that, that we've learned, you know, from, from the meditation Buddhist world and kind of figuring out how to apply them in areas that really they haven't been applied to um, before in, in quite this way. Yeah, I mean, I think with the first book, The Buddha Walks Into a Bar, when that came out, I realized that one of my intentions behind it was hoping that some young person might read it and they might start meditating regularly and maybe they go work for Goldman Sachs or something, but they're young, they're smart, they're intelligent, you know, they're like really energetic and they start to rise in the ranks and 30 years from now, maybe they're the CFO of Goldman Sachs. But because they've been meditating, they're actually more empathetic than they might be than any other sort of CFO. And maybe they wield that tremendous power with some sense of compassion. So I wasn't necessarily saying, oh, let's you know change everyone's lifestyle. It was, if could we get more people meditating at an earlier age so that as they continue to develop as human beings, that's a part of who they are. And uh, with the institute, it was sort of the next logical step. You know, I fully believe that if they didn't get anything out of the organizing side and they didn't learn a lick of traditional leadership skills, if they did meditate for six months with us that would already be transformative. They would already walk out more self-aware, more compassionate leaders. So can we get young people who are entering the workforce or a couple years into the workforce starting to do that work now um, so that we can generate a large network of people who are making meditation a big part of who they are? Mm. And it's interesting, you know, there's, and I, this goes back, I guess, in the, even in the Buddhist history, there's um, kind of, you know, the, the quote-unquote Hinayana motivations for practice, um, you know, kind of self self awakening, uh, freedom from kind of your own self delusion and suffering, um, and then there's this kind of gradual historical move out, you know, of, of taking that sort of understanding and not sort of limiting it to oneself. Um, I I like what you're saying because it seems like a natural extension of that kind of movement, um, where it sounds like what you're describing is an intentional effort to create widespread change, what, you know, whether or not someone agrees with your methods or whatever, or your philosophy or and any of that, that, still there's something that you're doing there where it sounds like you're trying to have a, a sort of large impact, and, and that's, that's quite interesting. Yeah, and it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I actually was thinking, so Jerry Colonna was someone that spoke at the Buddhist Geeks Conference this last year, and I was thinking about his speech the other day, and this beautiful notion they introduced that sometimes the, a good leader is someone who's willing to say, I don't know how this is going to work out. And I'm fully willing to say um, that I am not sure how this will work out. I, I do believe in the transformative aspects of these various things that we've put under one umbrella. And I do believe in every single one of the applicants that we've accepted to date. They are already doing incredible work in the world. Some of them are work in India right now working with refugees. Some of them you know, work in uh, after school programs. Some of them uh, work in, um, you know, in the shelter system. And they're all doing, I mean, it's, it's been phenomenal to see this diverse group of young people. And young in this particular instance is, 30, you know, 20 to 35. Um, it's, they're just inspiring. So I believe in them. And I believe that we can offer something to them to continue their trajectory. Then, I mean, that's great. So we'll see. we'll see. Yeah, yeah, no, that's it's it's cool. It you know it, it kind of connects, uh, and this is sort of a question I, I had for you is you know it, it seems like, and this is based just on on kind of observation, not 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 on a ton of research or anything, but it seems like um, this group of people you're describing, you know, twenty to thirty five, the kind of spirituality that most of the people I run into in, in that age range is a kind of highly engaged spirituality, if they're even interested in spirituality at all. Um, but like the way they conceive of the meaning of their lives is in terms of the kind of work they're doing in the world and the kind of change that they're helping make in the world. And I know that's not everyone in this age range, but at, le you know, at least the people I run across that are motivated and ha some level of educated, you know, they, they really care deeply about the world and they don't seem to be interested at all in a spirituality which is divorced from the world. Um, so I was curious what, what your experience with that has been and, and what, what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I'm completely with you on that. I, I've had that same hit. Um, 
So for the first book, I traveled to about 36 cities. And then for Walk Like a Buddha, I traveled to 17. So, you know, mid-October to mid-November, I was just on the road nonstop. And um, everywhere I went, and we're talking, I mean, primarily across the U.S. and Canada, but, you know, I would go to Salt Lake City, and I, it was my first time there, and I thought, God, I wonder what the people will be like. And they were just as motivated as wanting to be of benefit to the world as everyone else I had ever encountered. And it's like no matter whatever like minor prejudices I might have in going into a given city, whoever would come out and want to engage me in this sort of discussion were these amazing people who were really trying to be quite thoughtful about how they were going to live their lives, how they were actually going to find meaning in their work, how they were going to build a family in a way that actually felt good and sustainable and helpful for the world. It was like this like really amazing stuff. Um, so I think you're right. There's this growing trend of, of, and I don't want to limit that to young people. I think there's sort of like a, a conscious shift in culture right now. We're sort of seeing this rampant consumerism and maybe it's coming out of the recession and um, people seeing real suffering in the job market that they're saying, you know what, I want more than just a you know, safe and secure job and, and a white picket fence. I want to actually be in the world and actually helpful to the world. Um, so I think if that continues to go in that direction, more and more people will probably pursue meditation, not just as a way for them to become less stressed out or deal with their emotions more, more in a more uh, hands-on way, but to actually enter into that practice with the intention of trying to be helpful to society as a whole. Mm. Great. So maybe um, not switching gears, I think, but, but shifting to another facet of this. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about your book and uh, Walking Like a Buddha. Um, the first thing, as I was uh, you know, going through the book, the, the chapter I, I enjoyed the most was uh, Get It On Like a Buddha. Uh, so, and and, and you know, the reason I enjoyed it is not just because of what you said, but also because this simply isn't a, a topic of conversation that gets much airtime in most of the meditation centers that I've been involved in. And I, I suspect in most meditation centers in general. Um, so I wanted to kind of kind of get your thoughts on this. Uh, this. This whole chapter of the book, you're exploring various issues related to things like being single, uh, being gay, masturbation, open relationships, and even Match.com. Uh, I appreciate that there's a little section on dropping expectations around Match.com. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit about kind of how, what approach you're taking to this whole issue and, and, and all the various kind of facets of it related to you know sexuality, um, being a human that's in relationship or not in relationship. Um, how are you approaching this, and 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 uh, kind of how is it different, I guess, than than how we typically approach uh, from from the kind of Buddhist framework? these issues. Yeah, that's interesting. So, gosh, a whole wide variety of thoughts on this one. You know, I opened this particular section. Let me just give a little bit of background for, for people who have no sense of um, what Walk Like a Buddha is, which is probably most everyone. Um, Walk Like a Buddha is 50 questions that people emailed to me or, you know, sent me on Facebook or asked me at an event that I compiled and just sat down and wrote. And it was actually written in the period of six weeks. I just sat down December 2012 into January 2013 and just sort of cranked it out um, because I was really inspired. In coming off of the first book tour, I started hearing the same sort of questions over and over again. You know, to, like clockwork to this day, I would get an email once a week from someone saying, I'm going through a breakup and it's really hard to keep my heart open. What's, do you have any, you know, Buddhist teachings that might relate to this? And so some of these I get all the time, some of them I get once, but I'm inspired by, and I sat down and wrote them all up. So there's 10 questions on how to get a meditation practice going, 10 questions on um, work, 10 questions on going out, which is sort of this giant umbrella term of everything from how do we look at Facebook to how do we look at the Buddhist view around tattoos, um, 10 questions on social action, so somewhat akin to what we were just talking about, how do we actually create change in the world, and <clears throat> 10 questions on romantic entanglements, which is such a tricky area. And, I mean, I found that the sort of questions in there, I mean, I could have done 100 questions in that section, really. It, it's Those are the questions I get the most. Really? And, oh, absolutely. I mean, hmm. as soon as you present that you could have a dialogue with people around sex, dating, relationships, that's all they want to talk about. And it got to the point where 
you know, and I was touring around for the Buddha walks into a bar, I would ask people, what do you want to talk about? And someone's hand would inevitably go up and be like, sex. And it was like, you know, as soon as you gave people permission, that's all they wanted to talk about. Um, and I opened this section in Walk Like a Buddha with this story that when I was in Seattle, uh, I got there and there's a little winded, you know, it's sort of traveling nonstop. And I, I'd say, I said exactly that, what you guys want to talk about. And this woman raises her hand. She's probably in her mid fifties. And she says, you know, I'm, I'm recently single. Or no, I'm recently divorced and I'm starting to date again. And I thought, okay, I might know approximately where this is going. And then she says, and you know, when I'm having sex with a guy and he comes and I don't, sometimes like it's great for me, like I still enjoy it, but then he asks me and I have to tell him that I didn't and then it becomes weird and then I have to like sue this ego and um, and then like I have to make him feel like more of a man, then it's no longer fun for me. Anyway, what does Buddhism have to say about that? <laughs> what does Buddhism have to say about that? I'm curious. I mean, I, I joke that this is like the one time that my friends have ever seen me speechless and they like to hold it over me. Um, I think I basically deferred to the audience on this one, uh, and we had a really good discussion because with all these things, and I should be very clear, <clears throat> you know, with yes, people submitted like you know fifty questions and I answered them for this book, but at no point am I saying I'm the expert here. You know, like I have my own experience, I have my own understanding of the Buddhist teachings. Some people may agree, some people may disagree, um, but I'll share my experience and my my understanding as much as I can in as genuine a way as I can. And ideally, that sparks other people to have dialogue as well. <clears throat> and that's the most important part, that people are actually talking about these things. So to get what you were originally saying, yeah, I mean, you know, I might open up and say, okay, you know, here's some thoughts around being direct with your communication or trying to um, look at your own intentions and things like that. But from there, you know, it's everyone else bringing their own wisdom to bear and their own experience. And that's, that's really cool. Mm. Great. And, you know, that was one thing I was kind of curious about as I read um, some of the responses to your questions. And I know um, some of these also came out of your um, column that you did for a while in Huffington Post. Maybe you still do it. Um, what, what would Sid do? Uh, kind of a play on the, the WWJD theme that, that happened. Uh, I, get, I don't really see it as much anymore, but it was kind of like a meme for quite a while. Yeah, um, yeah. No, so what would Sid do? You know, Sid being short for Siddhartha, which is not, of course, any disrespect for for the man who went on to become the Buddha, but just it was the idea that I believe that they had nicknames 2,600 years ago, and maybe his was Sid. Uh, <laughs> but it was that notion that, you know, what if we had, we what if we were following in his footsteps? What if we were walk, walking like a Buddha, i.e. trying to explore what spirituality and meditation and these Buddhist teachings actually mean in today's world? And what would that look like? So similar stuff, you know, questions on dating, questions on work, questions on how to create social change. And uh, those, I, I mean, I think I'll probably revive that column pretty soon because so much of that work went into the book. I ended up sort of taking a bit of a hiatus and just focusing on the book, but I should start uh, blogging because I do, I really do love the dialogue aspect that people write in and I get to respond. Yeah, and, uh, you know, some, someone was uh, sharing, I think it was Ken McLeod recently, that, um, you know, if you kind of look through some of the early Buddhist texts, uh, the primary mode in which the Buddha was teaching, which Sid was teaching, was through question and answer, through dialogue. It's like 90%, um, if not more, of, of the content is in that format. So that's kind of fascinating. It is. It is absolutely fascinating. So, I mean, it's been uh, currently, you know, I'm, I'm actually taking something of a, of a hiatus. I was telling you before we went on air that, you know, just sort of coming off the book tour and then this is actually the first time I've had a real gap where I haven't had another book expected. So the next book actually comes out in September 2014, and it's The Buddha Walks Into the Office, so very specifically focusing on some of the stuff we were just talking about with the Institute in terms of work and uh, finding meaningful careers and things like that. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of in this interesting break where I, uh, I'm not traveling as much as I normally am, which is lovely, and I'm not writing, so I actually get to study a lot more than I normally do, and it's been really wonderful to do that. Nice, nice. And and kind of going back, uh, sort of last question. This is my this is my challenging question for you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as I was reading the book and as I was reading sort of your your early earlier columns, uh, what would Sid do? I, I often had the sense uh, of being a little bit frustrated because one, I sort of thought, well, you know, one, do these 
Buddhists from the past really have much to say on these topics. Um, and then two, even if they do, should we assume that it's relevant to us? Um, because so much of it is questionable. So I wondered, you know, maybe it would be a little more honest to just say, you know, what would Lodro do as opposed to what would Buddha do or what would Sid do? And, and, but the, you know, then again, I want, I want to sort of point out there is a long history, especially in the tradition you've practiced in, of people taking their understanding and kind of transposing it onto the Buddha. So I, I'm curious kind of what you're doing there and, and how you're thinking about that. Um, yeah. is, it, is it more helpful to just own your own kind of understandings or is, is it useful to kind of try to make sense of them in terms of a Buddhist uh, kind of context? Yeah, so I'm reminded of this, of this story, I think it was in the early to mid-90s when the Dalai Lama was visiting San Francisco and he met with this LGBTQ group and he really, this, I think that I talk about this in the section on, um, you know, someone that wrote me saying it's okay to be gay and Buddhist and of course the answer is yes, please, please do be. Um, please, we want more uh, people who are loving and open in all sorts of ways. Um, but the Dalai Lama he said, well, you know, there's this text by Tsongkhapa, and Tsongkhapa was this really great master. And in that text by Tsongkhapa, he goes into, you know, all of these various prohibitions, like you shouldn't have anal sex, you shouldn't have oral sex, you shouldn't have sex during the, during the day. So it, was, it wasn't even necessarily just homophobic or, or con condemning um, gay lifestyle. It was really condemning most everyone. Um, and there was a lot of controversy at that time, and the Dalai Lama turned around and said, well, really, what, what I mean here is if we're going to look at these ancient texts, the only way that we'll sort of break from that those traditions is by a communal dialogue, because people were basically saying, hey, aren't you sort of like the Pope of Buddhism? Can't you just like throw that out the window and adopt something a little bit more modern for our society today? And he said, no, that's not my role. My role is to continue to have a dialogue with people. And the way these things will shift is in a global conversation. And I thought that was actually quite brilliant. So, I mean, with all due respect to anyone who, who enjoys my books or anything like that, like, I, I struggle even with the, with the idea that people might look to me as a teacher in some form, even though I obviously do, like, you know, I did life retreats with the uh, Buddhist geeks, and I, I do teach in the Shambhala centers and things like that. Um, like, I don't think of myself as some sort of expert. And I think of myself as someone who practices a lot and thinks a lot about this stuff and loves to talk to people about it. And uh, so what would Lodra do? I mean, I don't think that's, I, I think that's saying that I have an answer that is the answer. And that's not true. I don't believe that. Um, I believe I have, I think about this and I like to talk about it and I put it out into the world and people either agree or they don't and that's okay because it's more important that they think through for themselves so, I mean, maybe instead of what would Sid do or what would Lodro do, it's like, what would you do? <laughs> you know, what, what are you going to do? That's the important thing. Like, what is, what is personal to you when it comes to dealing with prescription drugs, when it goes to drinking on a Friday night? It doesn't matter what my experience is. I can share it if it's helpful, but it's more important that you have your own understanding and looking at your own intentions around why, you, why you're doing what you're doing. Because I'm no saint, you know? I, that's not me. Um, but having a global conversation around things like, you know, some Kappa's text or, or Gampopa or whatever it might be, and how do we interpret that in today's world, that's interesting. That's interesting to me at least. It is interesting, and it, it I mean, it kind of brings up the possibility that in that conversation we're going to find a lot of stuff, you know, from the ancient texts which um, we simply don't find useful uh, or relevant. And then I think that brings up this constant, ever-present tension of, you know the conservers and the adapters, you know the innovators and the and the people that want to make sure that we don't lose something really important by by kind of having a global conversation and all deciding we don't understand it and then we throw out something really vital importance, um, and, and that's really interesting because a conversation allows for that tension to exist, um, as opposed to saying like we have to kind of resolve it. Yeah, that's exactly it. Cool. Well, thank you for uh, for being in this conversation with with me, and um, I want to. I'm kind of in the spirit of what we're exploring uh, of questions and bringing people into the conversation. I wanted to open it up to the folks that are live uh, here. We have a little bit of time. Um, probably can take a few questions. Um, so if you have um, the uh, Q&A app open, 
um, on the live stream, feel free to jot down your questions. Um, the other cool thing about the system we're using is you can vote up other people's questions. So this is kind of like uh, harnessing the wisdom of the crowd. Um, or, or the delusion of the crowd, I guess, depending on <laughs> where, the, where, where we're coming from as the crowd. Um, but yeah, let's start with a couple questions here. Um, uh, two from Sean. And Sean, I'm going to start with, uh, with your first one. Um, so Sean Fargo, uh, he said, Th thanks for your authenticity, Lodro. Um, I was wondering how you prepare yourself to write. Um, what kinds of inquiry or meditation do you practice before you sit down uh, at the keyboard? That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. So, um, you know, it's interesting. I, I'm not the sort of person that I, I was actually like in a Barnes and Noble a couple months ago, and there was some fiction writer whose name I've already forgotten, and uh, he was being interviewed, and I was sort of like browsing while I was overhearing their talk, and he said, "Well, you know, of course, every, you know, I I still write every day because every author should be writing every day." And I was like, "Oh, really? Is that what we're supposed to be doing?" <laughs> And it's, I like I don't I'm not like I don't have a traditional writing schedule. It's not like I sit down to write every day or that I, um, you know, it's when I I sit down to write when I when I feel like I have something that's been on my mind that I want to get out or something that I'm struggling with personally. Uh, there are definitely times when I'll sit down to write a blog post and it's like this is part of how I sort of figure out what I'm really thinking is by writing it out, re reviewing it, you know, going back to the drawing board. But you know, I, I my own personal practice is pretty consistent these days, which is good, um, and it's it's extremely important to me so that I have some grounding in, in the practice itself. So on any given day, whether I'm writing or not, at least I'm I'm going deep with my practice. And then if I'm going to sit down to write a book, I you know, I can pan over to my my bookshelf behind me, but you know, I just reach up and grab every Buddhist book that I think might be mildly relevant and reread it. You know, I'll read 20, 25 books before I sit down to write my own. And just even if I've read them a dozen times before, there's always new things in them that seem fresh and relevant to me. Um, so, you know, I try and not just do stuff from within my own tradition, which is Shambhala, but I, I've been actually reading a lot of Zen lately and um, Theravadan works and, and you know, really traditional texts as well. So it's been, you know, just really going in depth with my own study has been important. And um, yeah, and then when I sit down to write, I just I sit down to write. And what I mean by that is, I bring myself very one pointedly to that. I will sit down and go for two hours at a time, without judgment. Um, you know, I can I'll then put it aside and come back the next day and review it and and edit and things like that. But in terms of my own personal style, I like to to sort of let it all out because more often than not whatever it is, is something that I've been chewing on for some time. And if I'm going to sit down, and for example, I'll use one of my favorite ones from Walk Like a Buddha. Over and over again, I started getting this question, either in relationship to work, but primarily in relationship to romantic stuff, where someone would say, you know, I don't, I'm struggling with feelings of worthiness. What do you have to say about that? And it could be, my boyfriend never says that he loves me. Or it could be, I feel un, um, underqualified for my job. But in the core of it, and more often than not, they would use the word worthy. They would say, I don't think I'm worthy. I don't think I'm good enough. So that sense of heartbreak, you know, after hearing that over and over again and having dialogue, it's very easy for me then to sit down and just sort of express what I had already, essentially, whatever I had already had in that dialogue, whatever I got out of it. So a lot of my own writing is coming out of conversations I've already had. Thank you for that question. That's it's a really lovely question. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting. It, it seems like there there are a lot of parallels with writing and meditation, or could be, you know, in terms of how people approach it as a practice. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay, connected question um, from Amina. Amina uh, asks, uh, how much importance do you ascribe to the traditional texts? I, I mean, actually, for all of my, like, fancy Buddha walks into a bar controversial titling and stuff like that, a fair amount. I actually really do, um, you know, it's looking to the wisdom of our elders and their own experience. I find that whatever I read in traditional texts ultimately does mesh with my own experience. And that's why I think it's incredibly valid and wonderful for us to be studying. Um, if you continue to read it and something doesn't mesh with your own experience, 
then there's something going on there, right? Um, so for me personally, and I can only I'm like I'm not gonna say everyone should go out and read you know all these very particular things, but for me personally, I could get a lot out of Gampova's Jewel War and Mental Liberation, even I, if I myself have not had an experience of all the various hell realms that he will outline in detail. You know, I still have a basic understanding of you know this is what it means when you're actually really hooked by anger. So there's ways that we can look to these very um, very traditional texts and still pull a lot out of them, even if it's not necessarily literal. Right, and you see, I think you see this in, uh, in other re uh, religious traditions as well, like the different ways that people engage with texts and like are we taking it literally, are we interpreting it, are we transposing our own understanding on it, and that's okay because that's the nature of a text is that it's alive and open to that kind of transformation. You know, it's very interesting. Um, I mean, this is something that all religions uh, and all philosophies, I imagine, you know, have to deal with. Exactly, and I, I love that you said that because I was, I was thinking the same thing. It's living, breathing text. That's what the, the words of the Buddha are. And um, if we solidify it and say this is the right way, and anyone who doesn't practice these this aspect, you know, this particular sutra, in my way, they're wrong and they're doing Buddhism wrong. That's when we start to, you know, fall into fixed view. That's when we actually start to have real problems. But if we can interpret it, look at it, see it as our own experience is, you know, changing and morphing in relationship to the text, then that's really wonderful and invaluable. It's so we have to look at, you know, when we actually get stuck with that as well. Okay, great. Um, another question here uh, from Sean. Um, he was curious about who your primary uh, Dharma teachers are and, and what you like most about the Shambhala tradition. So my teacher is Sakyang Mipam Rinpoche, who I find to be an incredibly kind, genuine human being. And that's someone that I could then look to and say, I want to be like that. So from my own experience, and you know, I, I don't want to romanticize any of the Buddhist teaching teachers out there because I think we all they all have their, their foibles and their their particular quirks and things like that. But for me, I have been so overwhelmed by his kindness and his uh, brilliance. He has a brilliant mind and a his inspiration to actually really see the teachings um, be implemented in the world, not just practiced on the cushion, but implemented in the world. That has all inspired me. So that's, I mean, I, I personally have a lot of issues with uh, any Buddhist community to some extent in terms of how things get, you know, institutionalized and then how people's neurosis gets played out within institutions and things like that. I think that's all, I, I don't want to just sort of turn a blind eye to that. And I don't think Shambhala is by any means um, safe from that. But I believe that those teachings particularly coming from him and from other teachers, senior teachers within that tradition, really are wonderful. And I, I mean, for me, I was actually raised within the Shambhala tradition, but then I had my like, teenage rebellion years where I pursued other religious, other religious traditions and then also other traditions within Buddhism. And what attracted me back to Shambhala was this emphasis on being in society and being of benefit to society. And, you know, as Vince and I were talking about earlier, I, I think that's... I'm not alone in that in that inspiration that my practice isn't just about me and, and my small world. It's actually meant to be in and of the world. So uh -huh. interesting. That's, that's yeah. Interesting. You know, um, just to throw in a little Buddhist geekery here, I, I was thinking about, you know, the uh, like like the mind only schools and, and some of these kind of historical schools uh, that understood everything as mind. And I was curious, you know, if that kind of view lends itself a little more to a kind of uh, self-centered spirituality um, in the sense that if you think everything is your own mind, how easy is it to think about the quote-unquote world existing out there in a way where we need to respond to it and uh, you know we can think about it quote-unquote objectively. Um, and it's very interesting, isn't it, how different kind of understandings of the purpose of this practice can change how we relate to the quote-unquote world. Yeah. No, you're completely right. And it's, it's also very interesting in the fact that the vast majority of people who will practice meditation in 2014 will probably never hear of the mind-only school. Right. That's for sure. And um, 
they're going to have their own intentions for coming to meditate and some of them will be uh they'll be lifelong practitioners some of them will immediately fall away but the percentage of people that will actually go back to those very traditional uh and lovely teachings i mean i think there's there's you know real room in, in dialogue for minor only uh it's quite small so i think it's going to be interesting as meditation becomes more mainstream and accepted and how looking at how people use it as you just said to create their world and in what role it's going to serve in in today's society. Yeah, and it's it's interesting too because even though, you know, these philosophies in some sense are are uh they're they're ancient, you know, in the sense that they're thousands of years old, um they still are playing themselves out, you know, in terms of uh, like if you go do a mindfulness-based stress reduction class, there're bound to be these sort of philosophical assumptions and 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 views that that they're, they're maybe not named and they're not sort of saying, oh yeah, this comes from Gampopa's Jewel Ornament of Liberation, <laughs> Chapter 7, but they're still there and they still affect how people view um, what they're doing. Isn't that, isn't that fascinating that they're, they're still alive in that sense? It's true. Yeah. I, I, I do think it's completely fascinating, yes. <laughs> Of course, you're uh, <laughs> speaking to the speaking to the gospel here. Okay, uh, last question. Um, uh, this is from Dwayne uh, Miller. Uh, Dwayne, um, he's curious what your sort of most influential books uh, have been, um, both as a writer and also as a practitioner. Hmm. I'm turning to look at my bookshelf right now. Yeah, nice. Um, you know, I mean, the most influential recently for me has actually been my teacher Sakyong Mipam Rinpoche's book, The Shambhala Principle because it's not even a real dharma book. I mean it is a real dharma book. Don't get me wrong, it's chock full of dharma teachings, but it's not this traditional way that we look at it because there's such an emphasis. I mean he, there's a chapter on economy, a chapter on healthcare. Mm. So it's, it's literally it's taking society and then applying teachings to it as opposed to here's a book on buddhist teachings and how it might apply to society. It's almost an inverse of a traditional dharma book in that way. So I I think that's really remarkable that he did that. Um, and I, I definitely appreciated a lot of his other books. I mean, it's it'd be hard you'd be hard pressed to find someone who hasn't been inspired by Pema Chodron's work um, in today's world, and uh, in particular her book Comfortable with Uncertainty, and her new book Taking the Leap is actually really really lovely. I I was deeply inspired by that one. Um, the teachings of Sung San, uh, who's a Korean Zen master, very straightforward, almost brutal compassion from this brilliant mind, and I w I've always been really, really touched by his particular emphasis on compassion. Um, so those are, those are some good ones for sure. Uh, goodness, you know, I've, um, in terms of other books that might, uh, you know, have influenced me, I would definitely say Work, Sex, Money, which was early writings by Chogun Trungpa Rinpoche. Mm. Um, And you know, <laughs> for whatever it's worth, like completely unrelated to to dharmic books, I, I read a lot of like men's or gentlemen's guides, being like you know John Bridges, um, how to be a gentleman, and it's very interesting um, where it's not dharma teachings, but it's how do you actually show up in the world in an authentic way that is in tune with what's going on and respond skillfully. Like there's there's a certain genre of you know like manners guys and things like that that are not about doing things right but about being in the world in an authentic way which I think is really interesting because it's not rooted in a spiritual tradition so I've actually dove into a lot of his work too. Interesting. It brings up the question: you know, what what is dharma and, and what what do we mean when we say dharma? Is it is it sort of Buddha dharma or is it you know gentleman's dharma or, you know, uh, science dharma, like wh wh what kind of different dharmas are out there? And of course I can't, I can't emphasize enough, uh, as you pointed out earlier, Vince, the, the role of like Spider-Man and other X-Men comics and things like that. Captain America, I saw he, he made a, he made yeah, a he debut made, in the book. I, I was writing this, this book that comes out next year, uh, The Buddha Walks Into the Office, and I was writing um, a chapter of it across the desk from, from my friend who works at my publisher, and I looked up and I said, how many comic book references is too much for a book? So <laughs> I walked into a bar and I, I said, I think, I think three or four inches is, is probably too many. I said, okay. <laughs> and unfortunately, like, for them, I just kept sneaking them in. So, yeah, it's, you know, in terms of, like, pleasure reading, that's definitely me. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> Great. So some good some good book recommendations and then some good comic book recommendations. I love it. I love it. Awesome. Well, Lodro, thanks again for uh, for taking the time to chat with us and uh, yeah, talk about the work you're doing. It's it's cool to catch up. Cool. Yeah, and I mean, if people are interested, as I said before, you know, I'm always interested in dialogue. So people can find me on Facebook by typing in my name, Twitter at Lodro Vinsler. <clears throat> you know, I'm always happy to email with people, and, and of course, the Institute for Compassionate Leadership is Institute for Compassionate Leadership org. Um, and we're always looking for people who want to be involved in that in any way, mentor, coach, job placement partner, student, whatever. Great, great. Awesome, Lodro. Well, we'll see you online and, uh, and, and good again to chat with you. Thanks yeah, so much for your time. Thanks so much. All right.